good afternoon for all of those who came after we say good afternoon and evening. But as we were saying earlier, it's always good to have a dear friend here with us, Julio Padovan, uh, talking about uh, such an amazing topic, which is strange words. We're not going to say too much. We're not going to, because we don't want to give the talk away, but you will get a little bit more when he starts talking and you understand a little bit why strange words, right? But before we pass the word to Julio, Julio, as we like to say, you know, announcing him and, and making sure that we make this official <laughs> to the best way possible. Um, he is a friend. He is there whenever we need it, whenever we need to text him for something, a question or a concern, especially about spiritism. He's there for us and he's very um, helpful. Uh, it makes us think, right? Officially, Julio Padovan is a Brazilian national, has been working as a full-time researcher at the Rockefeller University since 1996, and he's also an adjunct associate professor at the Department of Chemistry and Pharmaceutical Sciences at York College, C-U-N-Y, in New York, in New York City. He holds several academic degrees, and he is a lecturer for both the physical sciences and the spiritist doctrine. Introduced to Spiritism at the age of 15, Julio dedicates his time to translating Spiritist books from Portuguese and French into English and disseminating it through lectures. He is particularly interested in studying and, and explaining the solid logical foundation upon which Spiritist concepts are built as well as in creating a strong association among those very same concepts. This way, we would like to uh, bring our dear friend, Julio, to the podium. Um, before uh, we start, we'd like to invite everyone to, um, if you're watching us, if you're following us online as well, and those here too, later on, hit the like button so we can disseminate the word. We can disseminate the, the work as well, and so that more people can actually get to see it, right? Um, we will, as usual have a moment at the end for us to ask questions. Julius love that, you know, when we ask questions, when we interact as well, not during, <laughs> but after, so we can ask questions and get any clarification that we may need. So let us put our brains and our hearts to think and um, work. So Julio, please, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters from this plane of existence and from the spiritual plane as well, of course, our mentors, our guides. Today we have a special topic, strange words. You're probably familiar with something that says strange morals. And throughout the lecture, you understand why I changed from morals to words, but basically I can tell you right away. It's because when we're talking about the gospel, yes, it's strange morals because we are looking at the whole text, but I want to convey to you why those texts or those excerpts are so strange. It's because there are certain words there that have very special meaning. So I'm calling your attention, not to the whole thing, but to the tiny little pieces that actually make it so special. Okay, so the lecture today is basically in two parts. A very short one at the beginning, where I'm going to give you an approach to reading and interpreting the gospel. It's not my approach. It's not the last approach that you will ever hear about. It's one type of approach. And if it works for you, great. If it doesn't, you are very welcome to look for something else. It has to be something that fulfills you, okay? So this is an approach that is based on logic. And the reason why I decided upon this is because Allan Kardec said that our faith has to be rational. If our faith is not rational, it very quickly deranges, actually derails, right? It degrades into fanaticism. Then we, we don't really believe, we believe. We basically just follow somebody else, which is also for, who is also following somebody else and who's also following somebody else. So we become a mob. 
as opposed to a leaning of individuals who think alike, who feel alike. We need to understand why we have a belief, why we feel that way. So here it is, that this is the part that I need to convey. We want, I want to explain to you what a premise is, and I want you to understand how to go from premise to a, you know, to a conclusion through something called hypothesis. And this is the shortest part of the lecture, very quickly. So first of all, what is a hypothesis? Because hypothesis is right in the middle of it, is basically the, um, the, the largest part in this process. So hypotheses are ideas. When you have an idea to go to the supermarket, when you have an idea to, to go to work in the morning, and then you say, no, I, I don't have an idea about uh, going about going to work in the morning, I actually have to. It's still an idea. It's still a hypothesis because you can choose not to. You have some, uh, some possibility of changing or having options there. So hypotheses are just ideas, and they can also be statements. Okay? Now, hypotheses are neutral, neither good nor bad, neither constructive or destructive or non-constructive, neg neither negative nor positive. And they are usually uh, uh, followed, uh, actually, they usually come after premises. And we'll you will understand a little bit uh, what I, I mean by all this, because we are going to have the application of this process by reading a passage, active passages of the gospel, and trying to interpret it. So I said the hypotheses are based on premises. So what is a premise? A premise is a proposition. I propose to do this that or the other. To go to work, I propose that work is important, or I propose that uh, having a faith, not necessarily spiritist, a faith is important. Having a spiritualization process, again, not necessarily just spiritism, is also important for, you know, for our development. That's a premise. So a premise is that a declaration, a statement that we make. Now, premise is very much like hypotheses are neutral, not good, not bad, right? So the premise is what we start with. We start with the premise, and then from the premise, we actually make statements based on that. And the, the statements that we make are then the hypothesis. And then we have to evaluate. In the evaluation, we can use data. What is data? How many people work? How many people go to Spirit the Center? how many people are, uh, have some form of spiritualization or another, or how many people cook at home, how many people buy food from outside, you know, order in. All these are data, pieces of data, okay? Now, we can do that, but sometimes, when, especially when we are dealing with very abstract things, we don't have data, especially, for instance, think about something from the spiritual realm. We have no way of measuring things there. So what we do in this case, we have a logical process, a rationalization, where we start with a lot of premises and we try to build an edifice that will actually stand up, that will not come down in ruins. Okay? So in the evaluation, this is the part that is interesting. We do not prove a hypothesis. We test a hypothesis. We evaluate a hypothesis, but we don't prove. And this is one of the most difficult parts for, mo for, for us to understand. And we saw this during COVID. Because if you're not, for instance, working at the CDC, if you're not an immunologist, whenever we had something about COVID, right, the, the population wanted proof. There is no proof. Science is not about proof. It's about evidence. In the same way that the justice system is also about evidence, because we don't have the final word on anything. If I give you a piece of metric tape, and I, get, I give the same metric tape to each one of you, and I ask you to measure the width of the door, if I have 20 people here, I'm not going to get the same value. I am not going to get the same value. For, for what reason? because the person measuring it is not perfect. 
Our eyesight is not perfect. And I'm not talking about 2020. We just not have, don't have 100% eyesight. And the metric tape itself is not perfect. Also, the door is not perfect. If you measure it very carefully from top to bottom, you see that the width of the door goes above like this. You know, it wobbles a little bit. So what we say, oh, the door is 32 inches wide. What we mean is that it's 32, perhaps plus or minus an eighth of an inch. So there is a variation there. This variation, that's the data that we have. So all the, all the values between 30, 32 inches minus an eighth or 32 inches plus an eighth are acceptable. So we have variation and therefore we don't have a final value. What we have is a range. So we, have, we talk about evidence, not proof. And because we don't have proof for anything, then what we say is that we test a hypothesis, we evaluate a hypothesis, but we do not prove it. And maybe something that we test today and looks okay, tomorrow when we have better knowledge about things, that hypothesis will no longer hold because our lives are dynamic in nature. The only absolute truth is the one that belongs to God. And only that is going to be forever one and the same. So this is very important that we move away from this frame of mind that we know something, we don't. We have an idea about something. We have a hypothesis that we tested, that we evaluated, and we got a result that makes sense to us now. A hundred, a thousand years from now, we won't know. Most people believe that it was the sun that moved around the earth a thousand years ago. Even today, there are still people who do not believe in what Galileo showed us. So it is so complex, so complex because we are trying to get proof which we don't have. And it takes a huge amount of personal effort to move away from this. When we find this, because it's a type of bias, when we find this applied to scripture, to the interpretation of scriptures, the scriptures, then it gets even more complicated because people go in, they start reading a, a passage, but they are already biased even before they start. This bias is not something that is done out of malice. We all have our own biases because it's based on education principles. It's based on our upbringing, uh, the society, the, the nearby, the individuals, right? Uh, those around us. All of this plays a huge difference. So this is it. Hypothesis, premises, evaluation. So what is the biggest uh, premise that we have in Spiritism when it comes to the gospel? That whatever there is in the gospel is the truth. Even if it has been slightly distorted or mistranslated or transli transliterated, this, that, or the other, or in 2,000 years or 3,000 years, if you think about the, uh, you know, the Old Testament, uh, even if we think of all these things, and we, we still say, okay, there is a kernel of truth behind it. That's our premise. And we start that, uh, all our thoughts based on it. Why is this so important? So in this picture, all these cubes are premises. And what we want to do is elaborate enough hypotheses, test them, and with that, create a sort of cement so we can build a tower. And a tower that will stand upright, that will not fall to ruins and will fall to pieces. So the cornerstone, which in this case is both figuratively and literally, it is the cornerstone over there, right? Is actually our most important premise. And everything that glues that one to the adjacent cubes and the ones above and, okay, are our hypotheses and tests that we perform to have this whole thing upright and stay that way. So now that, we, that I've said that, let us do our homework. You have the concepts, you have the idea. Let us look at passages from the gospel. 
And I'm going to start with this one. It's from Matthew 10, verses 34 to 42. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. He that receiveth you receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. It's a huge passage. There's a lot of things there. So let us simplify it. Whenever we have a big task, we apply my namesake's uh, strategy, Julius Caesar's divide and conquer. You fall, make it up, split it apart, and we take just the first part. And there you have it. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. In one word, really? <laughs> that is what took to make Jesus Christ man of all centuries. The one that has been, continues to be, and will ever be the one that divided you know, uh, human history. Really, you just say something as banal as that, and that's it. There must be something behind it. And this is why this is in the gospel under strange morals. Because think about it this way. You are basically saying, let's go to war. Right? We are bringing a sword. Look at the, look at the symbolism. We're talking about sword. We talk about division even within the household. So there must be something else. So... When we look at a passage that is that bad for us to understand right away, okay, we have to ask, we have to make uh, or create hypotheses, elaborate hypotheses. So we start by saying the words are not from Jesus, or they have been so damaged, so irreparably damaged or altered that we cannot prove one way or the other. Now, I just want to convey one thing to you. This is not a very good thing to do in logic. You see that here we have actually two hypotheses in one. Either the words are not from Jesus or they have been irreparably damaged. But we don't have time here today to go at every little thing at home when we are studying the gospel. We can do that, right? Because we don't have to write, we don't have to make a PowerPoint, and we are not you know, on a clock. So here I put the two together because the results of both of them is one and the same. If it's not from Jesus or they have been altered, they are again not from Jesus, right? So I can join them. But logically speaking, if I were to be uh, giving this lecture to a, a, an audience of logicians, okay, or philosophers, they would crucify me. In this case, a part of the expression, okay? So you cannot put two in one, but in this case, we can. So that's our hypothesis one. The words are not from Jesus. Hypothesis two, the words are from Jesus. And then we have to think something else. So now what we do is this. We elaborate a premise. So we have, if the words are not from Jesus, why should we bother? As, as far as a spiritualization is concerned. Perhaps historically we want to understand what someone said. Okay? Or how a society as a group changed those words. But for spiritualization, if the words are no longer from Jesus, then we no longer have the major premise, which is that Jesus is our paradigm 
of perfection. It's the, it is the closest representation of the divine here on earth. So if it's not from him, if the, the words are not from Jesus, there is no point, spiritually speaking, as an exercise of faith, to go after them, to try to interpret them. Now, if the words are from Jesus, then we have to put some effort, right? Because remember when we had that, um, that lecture about the, uh, the parable okay, of the workers of the last hour? And I said, we cannot throw away a single sentence, much, not even a word, much less a single sentence from Jesus, that everything, if he said it, that, is a, that, was, that was a reason, there was a point, so it's the same thing here. So if we have a passage that we cannot understand, but we try to test our hypothesis and we figure out that it, they were from Jesus, then we have to go and study it. If we are to persevere and improve ourselves spiritually. Now, hypothesis number two, we can split it again. So let's say that the words uh, are from Jesus, right? So then we can ask two questions, and those are difficult to swallow, especially the H21, which says we are just too dumb to be able to understand them. We don't want to, we don't want to accept that, right? But that's possible. Jesus himself said to you, when he was referring to the apostles, right? He was talking to his disciples. He said, to you, it was given the right to understand these things. So I speak to you directly but to those around the populace the mob the people in general it was not given to you know in terms of a liberty or a freedom for them to understand because they were just too ignorant ignorance in this case just meaning absence of knowledge not in the negative sense that we sometimes use the word okay for and hypothesis two two is okay now the words are from jesus but um we are capable, we have some competence, perhaps we're just being lazy, perhaps we're being uh, just too biased, too filled with prejudice. So we have to improve ourselves in order to be able to um, understand them properly. So you see, once again, we have two hypotheses here. It doesn't have to be always in twos, okay? I put in twos here because it's easier for us, all right, the moment, Notice that they are all mutually exclusive. If the words are not from Jesus, it's only this one. And this one is automatically what? Negated. Right? And here, either we are competent or we are, uh, we are competent or we are not. So the same thing. But you can have three hypotheses when you have, let's say, positive and negative and a neutral. You can have four or five. But for our purposes here, Today, that would be just adding a lot more talk and not so much practice. I want to practice this approach. So we have these four now, whether the last two here are a sub-hypothesis of H2. This is why I call H21. So what we'll do is I cannot talk about these two before I can actually test one and two, right? I cannot talk about H21 and, or H22 before I prove that H1 or H2 is the most conducive one. So we'll get rid of them. And I know it's hard to read now, it, but I did that on purpose because it means that I don't want you to, to worry about that. And I ask you, how may we test? Again, you test the hypothesis or you evaluate the H1, H2 pair. When you evaluate, you evaluate in this case two. If I had three, you would evaluate three at the same time. And you would have to come up with only one at the end. If you had three and you came up with two against one, then you had to do some other work there because it would, not, it meant, it would mean that you had not done it properly. So how do we test the H1, H2 pair? We go back to the gospel. But remember the first big passage was from Matthew. This is from Luke. Suppose ye that I'm come to give peace on earth? I tell you, nay, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one household divided. 
three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son and the son against the father. The mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother. The mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And he said also to the people, when you see a cloud rise out of the west, straight away you say, there cometh a shower. And so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be heat. And it comes to pass. Ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky and the earth. But how is it that ye do not discern this time? Yeah, and why even of yourselves judge ye not what is right? When thou goest with the, thine adversary to the magistrate, as thou art in the way, give diligence that thou mayest be delivered from him, lest he hail thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and the officer cast thee into prison. I tell thee, thou shalt not depart thence, till thou hast paid the very last might. So, big one too, right? And you notice at the beginning, if you remember the father against son, daughter against mother, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, seems very similar, right? About the sword, not peace, but the sword. So, let us try to see what we can do here. Again, we are going to get the first part of it. We are going to get just that part. We are going to now have this. And we'll see that this is very, very similar to the passage from Matthew. Let's put them to the two together, side by side. Why am I doing that? Because this is the data that we have. Remember that to test a hypothesis, we can either use logic or, or an argumentation or data. We have the gospel. Now, I could have also put here the gospel of John, okay? The gospel, other gospels or other parts of the scripture, but I don't have enough space there. And two, take my word from it, but do your homework at home. Don't take, uh, don't take my word literally, but no, when you go home and say, oh, let me see if I find this in John, for instance, or in Mark, and you'll find them. You will see that this, so now we ask ourselves this, If this was not correct, if this was a transliteration, if this was uh, the multiple uh, um, variations of different translations from 2,000 years ago to today, why would we have the same thing on the other side? Not the same words, by the way, but the same thought the same premises that Jesus is purported to have said, I came to bring the sword as opposed to peace. So then this doesn't prove that Jesus said it. You want proof? You find a time machine, go back there and record Jesus doing that or film even better because then you have audio and video. Okay, and you should also have him sign a declaration saying, I stated this on this day, on this, at this time of the day, and to this number of people, and collect a few signatures for witnesses as well. That, that's what we want, right? We want proof. Right? We don't have that, but this is what we have. So we could go also to the Gospel of Mark. We go to the Gospel of John. We are going to see similar ideas. So the point that we might say, oh, but, they were all together. They were, perhaps there was a conspiracy theory. They were a group that wanted to create these ideas. Okay, no, no, it's valid. That's what I want you to do. I want you to play devil's advocate. Ask yourself this. Create this hypothesis that they were all conspirators. They were trying, the, all the disciples, the apostles, okay? Um, they were conspirators. Do you really believe that that type of con uh, conspiracy would have survived more than 2,000 years? We can't even make some today last for five years. We're talking about 2,000. And 2,000 at a time when people did not have WhatsApp, when people did not have internet, when people did not have hard disks to record things and, and keep it for posterity. People didn't even know how to read and write. They had to tell one another. So for a, for, for a tale to have survived all this time without being so, you know, adulterated, changed, altered, it means that they mu in, there must have been a kernel of truth. 
it is the kernel we are interested in. We are not interested in the, all the fluff that is around. We want the, the core of it. If that's what is important for us. So you can ask that, but then your own mind will lead you to test that hypothesis and say, this is not possible that they were conspirators, that they created all, this, all these lies, this nonsense. Because you will say, but how would they? Then you have to ask yourselves, because you cannot just stop halfway. If once you start the thought process, you have to go all the way to the end. You create the hypothesis. You have to test it. You cannot just have a hypothesis. So you created the hypothesis that they were conspirators. Now you test it. Would that, you know, if they were conspirators, how is it possible that their conspiracy, even after the man died, survived all this time? You can be as cynical as you want. You will not, unless you lie to yourself, which is what we do. Humans are phenomenal at lying to themselves. We all are. Okay? Uh, that's the only way you lie to yourself. But if you really pursue the truth with an open mind, you are open to evaluate things, you will see that you created a hypothesis and you yourself checked, evaluated, tested the hypothesis and and showed it, did not prove, showed it to be false based on the data that we have. So many Gospels. And the length of, and the time that this has been with us. Pretty much in the same way. So now, if we look this part here, we're talking about enmity. Right? I, Jesus is saying, I do not bring peace. I came to bring the sword. So how is it possible for Jesus, the, what we hold to be the paradigm of justice, of meekness, of, of tenderness, of, of uh, everything that is plenitude and perfection in this world, as close as we, as we can understand these things, right? How is it that he said such a thing? But now we have already said that, yes, we tested that hypothesis. It is, it has to be, it has to be, you know, a kernel of truth in it because we see it from many different authors and it has survived 2,000 years and, and, and counting, right? So we must then realize that there is something else behind the words. Even before we think if there is a moral or not, we have to think of the word and the words in this case. Jesus did say yes, but then this might not have been the way or what he wanted to convey. Either the words change in all, this, uh, in all these years, and then we can go to people who are you know, uh, prof uh, professionals, proficient in Aramaic, ancient Aramaic, ancient Hebrew, ancient Greek. We can look at all the translations, and they will say to him, no, no, that's how it was. So then it must have a hidden meaning. We cannot just read and say, oh, yeah, I believe this. Because if we just say, I believe in it, just like that, without an explanation to ourselves, it means that we are just accepting something without really thinking about it. It is a flawed faith. It's an empty faith. Look at the next one. For I am come to set a man at variance. At variance means at odds, okay, against his father. And by the way, for those of you who are wondering why I'm using 15th century English, it's very simple. It's because it was, it's one of the faithful translations we have. The new translations, in, a, in an effort to make it simpler for people to understand, have some ideas introduced. And this is why I keep with 15th century. This is the King James Bible. It's not even a new version of the King James's Bible. Okay? So that's why. So now, look, how is it possible for Jesus to say, yeah, my job was to come and set father and son against one another, mother and daughter against one another, okay? Daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. You notice that there is no father-in-law against brother, uh, you know, son-in-law? Why? Because it was the wife's duty to live with the husband. And a wife without a husband was not considered not even a free person. 
there were no free, uh, no, no single women. The concept, okay, the concept of a person, especially a female, not being married was not accepted in those days. So in the same household, if you had a, a son, then you have son and father. You have to start with the father and mother, unless in one of them is deceased, of course, right? Now, the other thing is you don't have divorce. So if, they don't, if they're not dead, they have to be there. They have to be putting up with one another and living under the same roof. So you see, you have to go after the words. You have to understand every nuance that they are actually conveying to you. And then, and then, of course, if the son marries, the son still lives with the parents, right? It, he brings the wife there. Therefore, mother-in-law, okay, daughter-in-law, but not son-in-law, because the son, okay, will be in his own house, and then it will be his father. It will not be his father-in-law. It will be his father. So you have to take every little word there and try to find a meaning for it. And a man's foes shall be from within. So it's not just that we're talking about enmity on the first part that I highlighted, this one here. It's not that I'm saying that this is a generalized enmity, that one is being an enemy of another from within the family. It is really, really deep, entrenched in the unit of society, which is the family. So if Jesus did say, so we have here, the one from Matthew, the one from Luke. If Jesus really said all these things, there has to be a reason there. And now, now is when, once you are satisfied with the hypothesis that you create and how you went about testing them, evaluating them, you don't prove any one of them. Now you have to find the meaning and the meaning is only as good as the work you put in. If you just read it, that's it. You don't think about it. You're just going to accept it, but it will make no sense to you. There will be no real deep meaning, spiritual meaning to you. But if you now see this, it's okay. These were from Jesus, but he cannot have said that he wanted to bring distrust, mistrust, enmity within a family. So he was probably referring to something else. And what is the something else? Then you, of course, I cannot have you know, all the time to show everything, even though we're going to be here until tomorrow, at least until 10, right? It's about an hour to North Beach, isn't it? Right. Okay, so until 10, okay? We have another appointment. Um, but it's even that, we can't cover the whole gospel. The point is, there must have been another meaning. And the other meaning we find when he says things such as, to you, it was given the opportunity to understand. But to the people, to the general people, it was not. So Jesus knew that whatever he was saying at the time was so revolutionary. It was so beyond their capacity, their ability to comprehend that it would actually, for those that embraced it, it would actually create enmity against those who did not embrace it or would not embrace it. And this is what we have been saying, right? Look at how many religions we still have. And we, are, we talk about religions. We're not even talking about philosophies. By the time we get to philosophical beliefs, not necessarily religious, such as spiritism. Spiritism is not a religion, right? It's philosophy, science, and religion. So it's actually a doctrine. We don't call ourselves philosophy. We do not call ourselves religion. We do not call ourselves science. We call ourselves a doctrine because all three must be together at all times. You pull one, you, the whole tapestry falls apart. So imagine if we were to go there, only thinking of religion, okay? We have so many dissensions, right? So many things. So it meant that his words would not be well understood or even understood at all. This is why it sounds so strange, crazy even, that he would have said that. He did, but he knew what he was saying. 
he, he was actually telling us, what I have is so far out in terms of your understanding, your ability to comprehend, that you will pull it, it to pieces, each one of you from one side, from your own perspective, your own point of view, and you will war against one another. And this is why Jesus used the family, because the family was the unit. Today, we don't have the family as much as a unit anymore. But in those days, you lived under the same house. You would, got, you would get married. You would have kids. Everyone, you would sometimes have three, four generations. You, would, you just didn't have more generations living under the same roof. Because what happened was that people didn't live that long. Lifespan was about 30 years. Three, zero, 30 years. Okay? Oh, but I read in the Bible that someone lived to be 130. Did, were you there to count it? Okay? Again, uh, again, proof or evidence? What is it that you want? You don't have either in this case. Not even evidence. Okay? Just to give you an idea. I think it was Ramses II. It was a pharaoh, in, uh, an Egyptian pharaoh. And he was the odd man out. He was the oddball. He actually lived to be 92. In 92 years, he spanned, okay, six generations. Because we're talking about even before Christ. So if you, if at the time of Christ, the life expectancy was 30 years, at, in Egypt it was even before. People would die in their 20s. Okay? Most of us here wouldn't would be here listening to it, spiritually speaking, <laughs> just with our spiritual, you know, with our perispirits, right? Um, some of us would have been reincarnated twice in those in that time, okay? Think about, uh, you know, I know people that are in their 90s, right? That would be what? Four, four almost five, re five lifetimes from those days. So Ramses II, I think it was, uh, pardon me if, if I, rec I don't recall this correctly, but the fact that he lived for so long actually gave credence to the fact that pharaohs were gods on earth. They were not gods as we, as the Greeks would say, gods from Olympus or gods from heaven. They were representations of God, of the divine, on earth. Because he lived for so long that in the same household, even if you had three generations living under the same roof, they all knew one pharaoh. It was unbelievable. And also he was a master of propaganda. I mean, in the negative sense, propaganda. He lost a, whore, he lost a war to the Hicksis and, and, and the Hittites. And his army was m massacred, okay? But he made a pact with the enemy, not only to let him go, you know, pending, of course, the payment of a fortune and slaves and this and that. What well, was considered assets in those days. I'm sorry about that. But, um, but also he had a, 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 let's say, a, let's put it this way, a document stating that it was a stalemate, that they reached a, a point where they decided the war was not profitable for either side. So it's not that he lost it and miserably, he actually decided that it would be better not to continue the war. The man was a genius at the time. You know, and, propaganda uh, uh, terms. So here, we know that this family unit that we, we have today is somewhat in shambles, if we look carefully throughout society, was, was very, very important because everyone was in the same place, ate the same thing, worked in the same, I mean, people worked in their backyards to eat. There was no, um, no drive-through. There was no McDonald's. There was no 7-Eleven. You, you want to have a salad? Go back there and put some seeds in the soil. Wait about three, six months, depending on what you, it is that you're, you're, uh, you're growing. And that's it. By the time we reach the Middle Ages, when you wanted to write one piece of paper, you want to have a, a piece of paper, one sheet, it will take you almost a year to make that sheet of paper. Of course, it was not sheet of paper, okay? It was um, uh, sheepskin. 
but that's what they had. You had to find beetles in the forest, grind them, the right beetles. That will give you maybe a red color or a red hue, a blue hue, and this and that. So we don't understand what we are reading here because this is so far removed from our reality. So in order for us to test these hypotheses, we cannot be, sorry, lazy. We have to make an effort. So see, something as simple as why is not, why is the uh, father-in-law and son-in-law not present? I mean, Jesus wouldn't, Jesus didn't suffer from Alzheimer's. He was, you know, he did not suffer from any of the uh, neurodegenerative diseases that we have today. So why is it that he, the representation, the closest representation of the divine, would have missed the opportunity of saying that there? I mean, was he considering father, father-in-laws and, uh, and sons-in-law, son-in-laws less important than all the others? But males had more, important, more importance. So then he would have dropped the daughter-in-law and mother-in-law, right? And he didn't. So you have to read and go beyond to test your hypothesis. So now that we have seen quite extensively, I, I hope, and I hope you are satisfied, we can tell that now the words are from Jesus. So a hypothesis one is automatically what? This... Proven? No. Discarded. Because since we don't prove anyone, we do not really disprove a hypothesis. We just discard it. It's a big difference. Okay? We can keep that for discussion if you prefer. But for us here, like as I said, and this is for everything in life, okay? Test the hypothesis. Evaluate a hypothesis. And if it's not good enough, it doesn't, the data that you have, does not, is not conducive to it, discard it. You don't disprove it. So now we have the, the between H1 and H2, only H2 is still alive. Maybe a thousand years from now we'll discover that H2 doesn't work either. We'll need an H3. I don't know. What we have today is enough just for me to move from H1 to H2. Good? But now that I have H2, I can ask myself, H21, H22. Are we competent or are we not to look at the passages? Well, you cannot use pride because pride would say, okay, cannot be H21, right? You're biased. We don't want to accept to ourselves that we are incompetent. By incompetent here, I don't mean negligent or irresponsible. I'm just meaning uh, we are not able to interpret. That's all. As simple as that. But even that is too much for our pride. But it's not about that. It's not about pride, really. Remember that I said at the very beginning, when you're testing hypotheses, when you're evaluating hypotheses, you have to keep an open mind. So what you do in this case is exactly what we have been doing. Haven't we been uh, analyzing all these previous passages, at least the first piece of each passage from, my, from Mark and from Matthew? Didn't we do this until now? So we are competent. It's just a question of effort. It's a question to talk to one another. Oh, I don't know if this word is correct. You go to a person that does translation or who is an expert in um, ancient Aramaic, ancient Hebrew, Coptic, ancient uh, Greek. Because ancient Greek has nothing to do with Greek. Just the alphabet. The grammar is different. The words, most of the words mean completely other things, have completely other meanings. You have to be very careful. It's in the same way that if I give you ancient English and I put, um, not even English from the 15th century, but if I give you ancient English and English, you will say, what is this? Which language are you using here? Because you will barely recognize them. Same thing for French. Ancient French and French have very little income. I mean, a very, a, a very well uh, educated person that knows French or have, you know, is French or have learned French from the very beginning may be able to read a big, a big chunk of it, but uh, with, not without some effort, okay? So we go to an expert, but we can also do the homework on our side just by looking, asking, 
why is it that the daughter, uh, the, the father-in-law and the son-in-law was missing? Things like that. So now we have these two. And we have already, in a way, answered our own, own two hypotheses, right? Because we have been doing all that. So let us just continue to see that we can, re, uh, we can even strengthen our confidence that we are competent to do so. Remember that we only looked at the first excerpt of each passage from Matthew and from, yep, from Luke. So let's keep going and do the same thing now for the rest of the, um, of the passages. So more strange words. After all, we are all about being weirdos. Okay, so this is the big thing from Matthew. We are going now to cut it in two parts and we're going to focus on the last part. And there you have it. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Even if that goes straight over all your head, okay? You know about the parable, not a parable, a passage. It's not a parable, a passage where a young guy who was rich came to Jesus and said, I would like to be with you, Master. I would like to follow in your steps. I would like to go from now on with you everywhere, and I will give you my fortune. Everything, no, he said, sorry, I will give you everything I own to you, right? And then Jesus said to him, Jesus being capable of seeing the, in the pretty spiritual bubble of that, of that young man, right? said to him, yes, so relinquish everything and come with me. And the young man turns around, very sad, because Jesus said, now, relinquish everything you own and come now. He was offering money. Jesus didn't say anything about money. He said, relinquish everything now and come with me. And he couldn't do it. And that in itself is almost like a strange moral. Why is that? Because at the time, he was the firstborn male, okay? He would inherit everything from the father. The father had just passed away. But in order for him to inherit everything, it was the custom of the time that you had to be seen at the funeral. If you were not there, you were automatically disinherited. And society, the same society, the same society that would stone a woman to death if she was an adulteress, but would not do that to a man, would also make sure that he would not receive a penny if he were not at the father's funeral. There was no excuse. So you might say, but what is this? He had said to Jesus that he was going to give his, you know, his belongings, but there was something that he wanted to keep. There was another thing that you would inherit, being the first male, first, uh, firstborn and male, the status, which was very important those days. You could have, you could be penniless. It's still the same. For instance, just look at Great Britain. You have earls and dukes. You have, you know, all types of royalties that have nothing, but they have the title, and you try to touch them. It's really, really difficult, right? They have a problem still. I'm not saying that all of them are like that. It's not, it's not that. But they still have those who abuse their titles, even though they may not have a penny to their names, to their titles. The boy wanted the title, not so much the money. And when Jesus said, relinquish everything and follow me now, that meant you do not, because he said, I have to bury my father. And he said, let the dead bury the dead. So if we understand that one, how is it possible that we don't understand this one? Isn't it the same thing? In other words, Jesus was saying, if you value God less than you value your father or your mother or your house or your job or this or that, there are all material in principle because even mother and father, even those things are material, are from this world. Our ties are spiritual. So even in that situation, okay, if you cannot, if you cannot 
discharge yourself from it. If you cannot abandon these things to follow God, then you don't really put God in a prior, as a priority. That's what Jesus is saying here. He is not saying abandon your mother, abandon your father, because in another passage he says, you know, protect, respect mother and father. But you always respect the father first. Respect God above all things. So this is what he's saying here. So aren't we competent? Even if we're not getting everything, I don't know if I'm getting everything. I'm not saying that this is the last word on it. Tomorrow someone can come in and say, oh, we missed this. We missed that. There's another word there that we can tweak even more. Yep. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for me shall find it. Be careful how it is written. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He who is too worried about his own life is actually losing it because he is valuing material things, physical things. This is what it's mean, it, 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 the meaning that we have there. But look at the other part. And he that loseth his life for my sake. So it's not about losing one's life, because if I commit suicide, we know in spiritism that suicides are, um, are very, uh, they are acts of aggression towards the physical body that we, we end up receiving a lot of um, consequences, negative consequences that may take one, two, even more reincarnations for us to get rid of or actually to overcome. So... It is about losing one's life in the name of Christ, in the name of a higher spirituality, of a spiritualization. In other words, you don't steal and you die of hunger. In those days, you think about it, right? You did not have a little plot of land or you were not a free man. If you were not a free man, you, even if you had money, that was stolen. That's what people would say. Free, if you were not a free man, you could not have money. Slaves did, were not allowed to have money. So if you had money and you were not a free man, you had stolen it. There was no concept of you are innocent until proven guilty. You were guilty, period. So that's that part here. And then he says, you that receive, you know, he that receiveth you receiveth me. So in the sense that when we treat others with respect is as if we were in the presence of Christ. Christ is reflecting himself on all the acts of meekness, in all the acts of charity, in all the acts of goodwill that we do. So when you are actually doing something positive, constructive, it is as if Christ were right in front of you receiving that action. That thought, sometimes you, 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 you say a prayer for someone who's suffering, who is, who is hurting. Even if the person doesn't know, actually, that's the best way to do it. Because if you say, then we would never know if you did that because you wanted to know, people to know that you were saying the prayer or if you actually did it out of the goodness of your heart. And then he that receiveth me receiveth him. Okay. So in the original, it is him with lowercase. This him is God. So today we would put it him with capital H. Okay, over there. Because look, Jesus said, him who sent me. So who sent Jesus? It's only the one above it, right? Even if we don't know what God is, it doesn't matter. X, the name doesn't matter. A rose by any other name would still smell as sweet or, or would smell as sweet. That's how it's the original. Okay. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet, sorry, shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Well, that seems to be a, a bit of a twister, right? Um, a mind twister, not a tongue twister. No, it's basically this. If you are opening your mind, receiving, you're opening your mind to someone 
more spiritualized than you are. A John, John the Baptist, for instance. That even before Christ was baptizing people, those who allow themselves to go to the river and be re you know, reborn through baptism by having the waters, right? They are what? The, they were receiving the prophet. They were listening, heeding what the prophet was saying. So you get the prophet's reward. What is the prophet's reward? The spiritualization, the good thoughts. This is not financial reward. It's not an asset. That's what it means. And then the next one, he that receiveth a righteous man. What is righteousness? Justice. So if you open yourself to a just individual, to an individual that holds justice as if it were the last thing on earth, the last bastion of, of, uh, of, of, of humanity, right? If you are open to that, you yourself is becoming what? Just. You're not just listening because you just want to kill time. You are interested. So then you receive the righteous man's reward, which is justice. You incorporate the justice in your own personality. And this is important. And finally, whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water on the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no, way, in no wise, no way, lose his reward. What is that? They were in, in a, uh, Palestine in those days were not as dry as they, uh, or arid as it is today. But still, was not as developed as it is today, right? You could not just stop at any gas station by a bottle in you know, a bottled water so even the, the the small places where you could have some water small lakes and oasis they sometimes were poisoned so water is the symbol is is the symbol actually symbolizes not only purity but the elixir of life because we cannot live without water. We can live with a lot of, out of, uh, without a lot of things. Coffee, sodas, even juices, you know, freshly squeezed if you want to, but not water. Our physiology will not allow that. So water here has a symbol. So if you give this gift of life, this elixir of life to someone and look, and here's the important part, in the name of a disciple, in God's name, because the disciples were the, what? The ones who were speaking for God, for God, on God's behalf, right? Because Jesus did not say this just when he was around. Because then he would have said, in my name. No, he is saying in, in the names of the disciples because they were going to continue his work. Then he's saying, in truth, I say to you, you will not lose your reward in any way. In other words, you will, that will be written on your soul, seared in your soul by God himself. That's the reward. And we still have Luke. Don't forget that. Big one, we do the same thing. We get the second part. And I, I, I'm going to do this because at the second part, the two separate from one another. Okay? But we're almost there. And he said also to the people, when you see a cloud rise out of the west, straight away you say, there comes the shower, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be heat, and it cometh to pass. And ye, uh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that ye do not discern this time? In other words, people knew how to read the weather. I mean, not with instrumentation that we have today, all that fancy work, all right? but they still knew how to read it. And if you look in, uh, geographically in Palestine, you will see that all these things are still there. Okay, if the, you have a south wind, it means something. If you have something coming from the west, from the east, and they even the Greeks even had names for the different types of wind. If the wind came from the north, if the wind came from the west, from the east, from the south, everything had a different name because it was associated, either it was the damp, either it was cold, either it was a warm breeze. It was so important and so reproducible year after year. It would always do the same thing that actually had special names. So he is saying, you can discern the material world, the physical world, I should say, right? You, you understand even these things without the instrumentation. You are capable of doing that 
and yet, and yet you cannot understand yourselves. In other words, you see, right? You see a little speck. You know that one, right? You see a little speck in your, your, in your brother's or sister's eye, eyes, but you don't see the sty across your own. So what Jesus is saying here is apply the hypothesis. Don't be lazy to think about things because you are doing this to the weather. Why are you doing this to the weather and not to yourselves? Because the weather was important. If you had the wind changing directions or coming too early or too late, your crops would not grow and you would starve to death because, the, like I said, no McDonald's, no 7-Elevens, no drive throughs for you to, on supermarkets to stop by and just get what you need. You had nothing. And because it's not that you have a lot of mobility in those days, your, your neighbor will be in the same dire situation. So it's not that you could pop over, as the British say, oh, can I borrow uh, you know, a cup of sugar? Well, they didn't even have sugar in those days. But you couldn't even buy a head of lettuce or some figs or dates. No. Because in the same way that your fig tree, your date tree, was gone, theirs too were gone. Yeah, and why even of yourselves judge ye not what is right? In other words, why is it that you have this ability to look at the weather and you do not apply that judgment Good judgment, in the sense of evaluation, analysis, discernment. Why don't you apply that to justice, to what is right? Whenever it comes to justice, you do what you please, when you please, the way you want it. In other words, you just called us children. Because that's exactly what children do. Out of malice. Out of malice. But when you're an adult, that is no longer cute anymore. And we have been doing this now for 2,000 years after the message, and we still have not learned it. When thou goest with thine adversary to the magistrate, as thou art in the way, give diligence that thou mayest be delivered from him, lest he hail thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and the officer cast thee into prison. I tell thee, thou shalt not depart thence till thou hast paid the very last might. We love to sue one another. We love to sue things as well, especially these days, because a thing usually don't have a face. So we don't feel as guilty. But it's still the same a type of spiritual crime. It's actually a crime of moral cowardice because we hide behind justifications. There are no justifications whatsoever. It's our pride justifying to our conscience what we have done and saying, I'll continue to do it because I want it. That is the id, according to Freud. That's the lower part of our archetypes, according to Jung, which Joanna Janus has a preference for. So here, what we are saying is this. Jesus is saying, be careful. And he has another passage where he says, before you lay your offer down at the altar, go and reconcile with your enemies. This is what it's saying here. Different words. Different words. Back to the thing, words versus moral. Different words, but the same idea. He's saying to us, reconcile first. Or make sure, you see, as thou art in the way, it's your habit to, you know, to, to, get the, to want to get the shirt off someone's back. So he says, give diligence that thou mayest be delivered from him. Pay heed, pay attention, exercise caution that you do not make him a mortal enemy, a mortal enemy, one that is going to pursue even after you go back to the spiritual realm. Him there is not the magistrate. He's the one you're suing. Everything is a he, of course. It's the language of the time. That's the thing you have to calibrate your, your, your heads, okay? It's not right or wrong. It's what it was then. We have to respect that. We have to understand and not make the same mistakes. That's a different story. But when we read, we cannot alter this inside he, she, and, and so on. We have to have the text as it was and just retune, recalibrate our brain and say, ah, society was male-oriented. So you have your enemy, 
instead of suing him, pardon him. Because by doing, by suing him, you may actually be doing something to yourself for a long time. Because then it's going to be his time to sue you for any harm and hurt that you're going to be causing him. Okay? And then Jesus finishes this, or actually Luke finishes with a, a very prophetic and almost omen type. Before you leave this earth, you will not do so. You will not reach spirituality, not in one reincarnation, higher spirituality. You will not do so until you have paid everything that you have done or for everything that you have done. Everything. This is what? Last part of the gospel, sorry, last part of the Spirit's book. The law of cause and consequence. God does not care if we're going to pay it or not. Cause and consequence brings the consequences to us of our own action, of our own words, of our own thoughts. And we will not be able to run away from them. We can hide. We can drink ourselves to, you know, until we are so drunk that we, we cannot think straight. But then when we go back to the spiritual realm, booze will not have that effect. Drugs will not have that effect. And our conscience will prick us from the moment we are awake to the moment that we are supposed to go to bed, but we won't go to bed because in the spiritual realm, our bodies don't need rest. It is what we colloquially speak of 24 7, 365, plus one if it's a leap year, which doesn't exist in spirituality. Okay? So you basically have no place to hide. Here we can, using torpocins, drugs, we can use medications as drugs, as uh, uh, drug, in a drug addiction type. We can use uh, alcoholic beverage. There are so many things we can do, even certain physical movements that will make us so dizzy that we will, we will detach ourselves from our immediate reality, but not over there. So consequence will be with us. It doesn't follow us because if it followed us, it would be an external event, an external source. It is in us because it's not, I know what you did last summer is, I know what I did last summer and last winter and last spring and last fall. It's in us. So Jesus is saying here, you will not go up in the hierarchy, in the spiritual hierarchy until you have sanitized basically your life. Of course, he had to speak to people that were not educated. So he says, until you have paid your last penny, your last mite. And that's what I had for you guys. So what I want to say to you is whenever you read the gospel, don't be afraid. You're not being a hypocrite. You're not being cynical. You're not being even heretical. Uh, if you actually think, oh, were the disciples, for instance, conspirators? Uh, was Jesus just some, some other person who had an agenda, a hidden agenda? No, do that. But don't just say it. Say it to yourselves, think about it, and go after testing that hypothesis. And you'll find surprising effects, and I think you will grow a lot if you do so. Thank you, everyone, for being here, for the follow-up questions, and for the invitation. Thank you, Julio. Amazing, amazing explanation. Strange words. <laughs> Strange word, right? So uh, we don't have anyone, any questions or any comment on the web right now. Uh, for right now, hopefully. Um, then you'll keep a tab on that with me uh, because I'm, I'm going to leave the iPad here. Anyone has a comment, question that you would like to ask? Everybody's quiet. Don't be shy. Julia, thank you so very much for 
helping us to exercise <laughs> our reasoning. One thing that it was in the back of my mind during the whole presentation, when you start reading for this uh, um, version of the Bible, etc., is really thinking, what were the original words? You know, it's like, a, a, and I don't know if it's a question or it's a reflection or what, but it's just something that I was thinking all the time. And please, um, I would like to know Arameo, the language that Jesus spoke, that was, it has a writing uh, version or it was only oral tradition? So, uh, you done? Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. So let's start with Aramaic. Um, uh, Aramaic, um, yeah. Uh, so Aramaic uh, had, of course, a written part, like all of them did, even, you know, Babylonian, uh, Assyrian. Median, Hita, the Hittites, language, everything had a, a written. The thing is, you had 100,000 people living in a region, perhaps what, five knew how to read and write? Not 5,000, five. In Egypt, which at one point had close to a million people, okay? Not even the Pharaoh knew how to read and write, only the, the priests at the high temples knew how to read and write and some special scribes, the ones who did the calculations to pay people, and they were paid in bread and beer. And they knew how to do fractions. Yep, there was no, nothing else. You ate bread and you, ate, and you drank beer, okay? Well, what passed as beer is a, it's a more like mead, but without the sweet part. So um, it, even if there was something, and we do have a few stella, so which are pieces of stone where they carve, but um, especially at Columbia, at the museum in Columbia University, but um, you, you don't you don't have a lot of things. There is another thing that it's very difficult for us to conceptualize, right? My name is Julio, J U L I O. And in those days, it would be dl, because they did not represent the vowels. They just, just spoke them. So whatever is left, we don't know exactly how it was pronounced because there are no vowels. Or actually, I should say there are no vocalic sounds. OK? Also, they did not have punctuation. So you would have a, li a line that would start. <laughs> there would be no end. The only time you would have some form of punctuation that they, sometimes after expressing a very long thought, they would go to the next line, either because they ran out of space in one tablet, in one stella. It's the name of the, the it's like star, but it does not, it has a different <laughs> root. Stella, it's the name of a, of a piece of uh, actually, not rock, uh, it's actually, dried mud, okay, where they would carve the, the words or the, the symbols. So they would have, you know, let's say a next line, a new line type of thing. Now you get to Egyptians, for instance, and there are other, there are other uh, civilizations like the Babylonians that were also iconographic. And what happens is that you have a, a square here, right? Think about this way. You have a, imagine that you have this, this area here of, of, of the screen, okay? The Egyptians wanted to write something, they would put, remember, Egyptians wrote, like most people in those days, from right to left, okay? So they would start in the upper corner. They would put a symbol there. If they need to put another symbol, and that symbol was too big for the space remaining, they would be low. But then when they had to put the third symbol, they would go back to the first one. Yes, it was this complex. So this is why no one really reads Egyptian in the sense that they can read and understand everything. What we do is we have people that read hieroglyphs, but interpret them. We read English or French or Portuguese or Spanish or Russian or Japanese, Swahili. It doesn't, we read them because once you see the, the, those, the, those, uh, those symbols, you know what is an A, what is a B, what is a B, or Z, and so on. In those days, they were icons, right? Or even if when they start having words, 
the way that they organized them was very, very crude, which is why, for instance, the language was also not very rich. We have a passage that, you know, it is, what is it? It is easier for a poor person to get in the, the, into heaven than for a rich man to go through the eye of a needle because what they used as rope was made from camel hair. hair. So the same word for camel hair was also used for the eye of the needle. So you have, it's also in the gospel, so you have words, identical words or identical, if it's not a word, icons that mean, that mean other things. So it's very hard to reconstruct that past. The Mayans, the Incas, the Aztecs, all of these in Central America, all the way down to Peru, okay, in, in, in Peru and Chile in South America, same thing. They did not have letters. They had icons, and they moved them around in the space that they had. This is why so, there was so many garbage in 2012, because a lot of people interpreted what they wanted to interpret, especially those warmongers or those terror mongers that love to disseminate terror, to disseminate uh, instability, basically. Thank you. I guess everybody, that, sorry, I answered everything, right? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I guess everybody's wondering how to pronounce their name with, without vowels, right? Yeah. Well, not even vowels, vocalic sounds. So, vocalic for instance, if someone's sounds. called Yvette, the, the Y is not, is, it's a semi vowel. Vit. It would be Vit. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing it, my mind already. I'm already thinking. Good Lord. No, no, Leo. actually. Could you ask the next question? Oh, Leo. 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 Leonardo would be on her. Linda. Whatever. Linda. Right, exactly. Leave it alone. <laughs> it. <laughs> um, anyone else that would like to ask a question, comment? I have a comment. I have a question. Um, first of all, thank you for explaining to us where the mother in law and daughter in law field started. So now at least gives us a base ground, right? <laughs> it's but, an old war. <laughs> exactly. But the joke actually has, has um, uh, it also serves as a base to what I'm going to ask. Early today, we were, asked, we were reading uh, chapter 15, verses 4, 5, 6, and 7 of the Gospel According to Spiritism, talking about uh, without charity, there is no salvation. And it's, you know, I start connecting, nothing is by chance, I start connect, um, chance. I start connecting with the, uh, I would say, second part of your talk there when you, you know, we brought the idea of loving God less than we love our family members. And we often come with, you know, uh, 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 in contact, per se, with this idea of, you know, do I spend more time at the center? Do I spend more time to God? Do I spend more time to, you know, um, um, or versus my family, and what's wrong and what's right. And obviously, I'm not trying to put you in a, in a bad position here, but what is the balance? What would it be practical ways and in, in, in help understand what is the, the right thing to do um, in terms of not leaving this divided life where we, we think that I'm leaving my family behind to serve God, right? Um, and, and we see sometimes we, we get divided, right? Especially for those of us who tries to serve at the Spirit to Center or whatever. If you're part of a congregation in the past, we may have felt that way. Just want to get some clarification on that because sometimes we do feel a little bit divided. The family is not just the unity of society. No matter how much we bash it, uh, and denigrate it, but it's still the unit of society, whether we like it or not. But it's also, from a much broader perspective, the spiritual laboratory. It does not mean that if we, experiencing, we experience something that, we, that is displeasing to us, that, oh, I have to go through it. This type of logic doesn't work. Perhaps you are experiencing that difficult moment because you are capable of handling it, handling it, sorry, handling it. 
And you are there because no one else would be capable as you are. So don't ever think that, oh, you know, I have this person or that person or, that, or I have this disrespect. That it is something that, oh, I must have done this or I must have done that, which is usually what we do. We have this linear logic. It can be very, very twisted. And in the end, it's not that all words lead to Rome, but all paths lead to God. So you may be there because no one is better prepared, not even your own mentor, is, is better prepared to deal with it. Your mentor is better prepared to strengthen you, but not really to deal with the problem. The same way that sometimes the coach is not a better football player or soccer player or whatever, basketball player, than the player itself, himself or herself, okay? The coach just has perhaps the experience of life, but it's not exactly the player himself or herself. So being the laboratory of the spirituality where we learn, and the same thing for school, for work, uh, different levels, of course, it is only in us that we will find the answer. How much time should I dedicate to one or the other? Because it's possible for us to dedicate ourselves to a cause. I'm not going to even say spiritual center because that's only one. Any cause, work or um, sometimes friends more than the family, but we do so as a means of escape. Not because we, so it all, we are the only ones who can actually ask that or actually test that hypothesis ourselves. Am I doing this? Am I not spending so much time with my family because I want to go to work, because I want to go to school, because I, this or that, whatever it is, because the work there I see is helping more people or because I just don't want to spend time with them. And the difficult moments we have, remember, never ever think that it's happening to you because you deserve it. It's not that. It is perhaps, perhaps, I'm, these are hypotheses. I'm not kidding, okay? Scientists would say this a thousand times because they are hypotheses. These are perhaps because, you know, situations where you are the best one, even with all that we say, oh, I'm still very young, spiritually speaking, I am still not very good and this, but sometimes to teach five-year-olds, you need someone who speak their language. You cannot talk about calculus with a five-year-old. You have to talk, baby talk, toddler talk to them. So you need someone who are on, at our level of evolution. And, and that will make us grow. If the other person doesn't listen, if the other person doesn't want to, to reconcile or to make amends or even to listen only, it's that person's fault. You have done or we have done our part in the sense that we have approached it. We have had all the love, all the care uh, and tenderness we could muster. And uh, remember, that's what I always tell my students. Three things. If you come to class, don't leave your brain in neutral. Put at least in first gear. No one teaches what they do not know, but no one teaches what the other one does not want to learn. So if you do your best, the other person doesn't listen, we do our best, and as a boss, it's a, it's a wife or a husband, a daughter, a son, a mother-in-law, father-in-law, whatever. They don't l listen to us. We have done our part. We cannot be charged for being negligent. Because we spoke, to use what we read today from Luke in this case, we spoke in the name of the prophets. We received the prophets. The other person did not want to receive the prophet. And we, did not, we also spoke in the name of a righteous man, but the other person did not want to hear the words of a righteous man. So they won't have the righteous man's reward or the prophetic reward. Thank you, Julio. Anyone else like to say a word or 
comment or question. Those people who do not ask questions, I heard that they would not be able to eat, right? Is it's something that like that, yeah. <laughs> it's a fundraiser, so perhaps they will eat, but they'll have to pay more. We're, Even we're that, judging the sentence, yes, right? Exactly. Hypothesis, let, let's, right? <laughs> let us let's test that hypothesis. <laughs> Which one is best, right? <laughs> we're not going to disprove or approve, or we're just going to test it. <laughs> so, Julio, again, thank you so much sure. for, for this uh, amazing talk. As we said at the beginning, Julio is uh, to the point to make us think, right? To make us ask for more. And I think it really drives us as well to. As he said himself, go and read, right? Read it again. And, and, and I guarantee you, and this is uh, on a personal note, that I will, you will feel the same way I do when I listen to something, I go read. And it's like, well, the person didn't speak about this. But it's pretty interesting. We find in our own um, elements that perhaps it was not mentioned, right? Um, not that the person has, whoever is here, has to cover everything. But at least it gives us the assurance that we can think by ourselves. Right. We can think by ourselves. And that's amazing. Right. That's a, a beautiful thing. So thank you again, Julio. Uh, for those of, of us um, who have the capability to go to North Beach is a little bit more than an hour um, uh, to see Julio tomorrow. What, please refresh my mind what we are speaking of tomorrow. Um, it's about the spiritual model and the implications to our daily lives. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, basically that we cannot really get away with anything because we leave our paw prints and footprints all over. All over. Yes. It follows us, right? <laughs> it uh, doesn't follow us. It's with us. <laughs> it's with us. <laughs> so uh, and this will be at 10, if I'm not mistaken, or 11? Sure. Julie, at what time? 11. 11. So we'll give you more information, um, you know, and, and it's important for us to... Um, Really, if we have the time, spend our time wisely. And why not with Julio uh, in a beautiful talk as well um, to perhaps share with him as well what we digest from this talk tonight. So thank you, Julio. What we would like to do is to, um, we'll say a, a, a final prayer um, and we will do our uh, spiritual passes today because the house is full and we also have our fundraiser at the end. And we'll just go ahead and take the time to pray together. <clears throat> 